Well, good morning, everybody. Happy to be with you on this wonderful Wednesday. I'll tell you what, it just seems like a one day, and I'm saying it's Wednesday again, so uh, that's crazy. Sorry, I'm adjusting my camera here. But anyway, yeah, time flies. We are halfway through the week of another, gosh, it's almost been two months of uh, sermons, five-minute sermons. It's been about two months. So we've preached, and you've made me dig up. Hey, Brother Millsap. You've made me dig up about 45 or 50 sermons in the last 45 or 50 uh, working days. Um, but anyway, uh, great to see all you coming on board. Marie, I really enjoy you joining us every day. And Sheila Kelly, and we got people from India and Michigan, India and Michigan. And there's Brian Hall, an old church mate, friend of mine. There's my baby Starla in Oklahoma, the nation of Oklahoma. But anyway, a bunch of you are jumping on. I appreciate that. Love, love y'all coming on. And we're going to talk out of Deuteronomy, um, uh, the seventeenth chapter. If you've, hey Brian, how are you doing? Good to see you, my brother. Praise the Lord, Sheila. Good to see you, Beth Combs. All our Michigan folks are jumping on right now, so that's a good thing. Um, Marie from Houston. All my cousin from Houston, all the way. Pray for Perry, uh, her husband, Perry Kathy. He's my first cousin, but he's really a brother. Uh, we've always been like brothers together. So pray for him. He's had some serious health issues. And just pray that, that uh, all these things will be released from his body, this, this uh, suffering, and that God would heal his kidneys and other things in his body that need to be healed. So pray for, pray for Perry Kathy, if you would. We're old preaching cousins from way back, uh, 40 years, amen. Larry King, good to see you. I'll kick in here in just a minute. For those of you that have not been on here before, we kind of just have a little meet and greet and uh, I give people time to come on board and then we kick in our sermon. Good morning, bro Larry King. How you doing, man? Praise the Lord. Good to see you, man. Well, we'll, we'll get started here. Um, in Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, verse 14 through 20, and then Revelation 1 and 6. I, I always do a lengthy Bible reading, but I'm telling you folks, if I'm trying to do anything in, in my life in these five-minute sermons, it is to get you to fall in love with the Word and prayer. I know many of you already are in love with the Word and prayer, but... It's to help encourage us every day to love the Word and know that the Word is what changes our lives. And prayer, those two things, if you can incorporate them into your life, loving the Word and loving prayer, then your life will be changed. But in Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, he tells the children of Israel, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as of all the nations, that are about me. The, the, he said, one of these days, Moses prophesied to them, one of these days there's going to be a king that is that you're going to ask for. And, uh, and he said, you're going to ask for that because we want to be like the other nations. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. Let God choose one from among thy brethren this listen to what i'm reading here today i'm going to elaborate on it but these are all key choose a king from among your brethren shalt thou set a king over thee thou mayest not set a stranger over thee which is not thy brother but he shall multiply horses to himself but he shall not multiply horses to himself nor cause the people to return to egypt to the end that they should multiply horses for as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Praise God. I mean, are you reading all this into it like I am? He says, when one of these days you're going to want a king. And when you get a king, you're going to want, he's going to want to make uh, breed horses so he can have something to ride on to take you back to Egypt, back into your bondage. So he said, and neither shall he multiply wives unto himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he be greatly multiplied to himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy. Here's another one. He shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites, 
and it shall be with him. And I mean, you, you hug this law, you hug this book that you have handwritten King and you love that book and you put it beside you. Amen. And it shall be with him that he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord. Why read the book? To learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to keep all the words of these laws and these statutes, to do them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom he and his children in the midst of Israel. And then real quickly, Revelation 1 and 6, and he hath made us and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So God is giving instructions to a king. One of these days, Israel, you're going to ask for a king. And there's some stipulations that I'm going to give you and, and I just told you out of Revelation 1 and 6 that we are kings and priests. So I think that we ought to take the advice that Moses gave the people in Deuteronomy and, and, and uh, operate our kingship just like God told them to operate their kingship. We're, we are in the law uh, part of the Bible right now. I'm, I'm finishing up uh, Deuteronomy myself personally. Uh, I'm finishing it up because basically what I do is every day I get up and read the word and I get a fresh word for this five minute sermon. Like I say, it's been about 45 or 50 of them and I am shocked, I'm totally blown away that I have developed that many sermons. But every day I get fresh manna from heaven and it depends on where I'm reading, where my devotion is. So you get the benefit or whatever of what I'm reading uh, because basically we'll go through the whole Bible eventually uh, together. Uh, so, I mean, you're going to get a good synopsis of the New Testament, the Old Testament, and, uh, and it's a fresh word from God, whether you like it or not, whether it's blessing you or not, which I think it is, uh, because you're coming back every day. Uh, just know this, that it is a fresh word. It's a rhema word. There's the Logos word, for instance, where, J where Peter walked on the water. Amen. He got out of the boat and he walked on the water. Uh, but that's the Logos. That's the whole Bible we, that we read. Uh, but that doesn't mean every one of us are going to get out and walk on the water. Amen. Uh, it, you know, you could say, well, it's in the Bible. Peter walked on the water, so I'm going to walk on the water. No, that was for Peter and it could be for you one day. But right now it's for Peter because it's a Logos word that we read. The, uh, it's the spirit of God. But when you need a rhema word, that means a fresh word, a fresh word from God for Don Hegg, for Larry King, for Sonny Kathy. The word you get might not be the word I need. Uh, understand what I'm saying? But, but anyway, so we are in, this, in the law right now. So therefore, the teachings that I'm giving you every day are, are, by, are from that um, context. Amen. So they're stern. They're, uh, they're beautiful. They're, they're convicting. Amen. But Moses prophesied that one day there would be a king. And, I, and from the best of my studies this morning that I could find, that it was about 300 years later that King Saul, the sure enough, the people of Israel did just like what Moses said. They asked for a king and King Saul, which became a total disaster, became a king over the children of Israel. He did. Now, remember, he remember what this word said. When you become king, don't get too rich. Don't get too many wives. All right. And don't make modes of transportation to get you out of the will of God. Don't create horses that will make you ride faster back to Egypt. These all apply to us, friends. Can you see this? Amen. So Moses prophesied it and Saul did exactly that. He got rich. He married wives and Solomon was really bad at this. He was the richest man in the world, the wisest man in the world, the most wives in the world and had horse stables. I stood on the on uh, at Megiddo, the, overlooking the Valley of Armageddon in one of the cities that used to be Solomon's horse stables. Amen. He did exactly what God said, don't do when you become king. Don't have, don't breed horses to take them back to Egypt and don't get too rich, which he was the richest man in the world. And don't marry too many wives, which he did every one of them. Folks, if we could just take the advice of God, 
If we could just obey God, our lives would be so much better. This is what I'm stressing. At the sake, for the at the very uh, uh, possibility of offending you sometimes, because I'm as I, I need God as much as you need God. Please understand that when a preacher is preaching to you, he's not preaching out of sanctimonious platitudes because he's perfect because he has arrived and because he never create, commits sins, he never has his own struggles, please understand that Sonny Kathy is preaching to you simply out of the word of God with all my faults and failures that I'm trying to improve on while I'm helping you try to improve on them. Amen. So we're working this together. Amen. None of us are perfect, but I got to tell you what the word says, whether I am able to attain to that or not. That's my goal. Understand me. I'm not telling you I'm preaching to you and I'm out, you know, fooling around or I'm out uh, committing sins, you know, that uh, premeditated sins and trying to know I since 1975 or actually 1980, when I came back to the Lord, have tried my best to live for God. But I'm telling you in the midst of all that, I have a lot of failures. Amen. But we're working this together, but we cannot leave out part of the word of God. It's kind of like if you smoke dope in your life. Well, I can't ever tell my children not to smoke dope because I smoke dope. No, that's foolishness. You need to be able to tell your children the things that you struggled with. You need to be able to say it doesn't make you a hypocrite because you smoked dope one time or you smoked cigarettes one time or you still smoke cigarettes. Amen. It doesn't make you a hypocrite to tell people you love don't do this because it's not healthy. Amen. And so this is where I'm coming from. I just want you to know where I'm coming from. Amen. So Moses prophesied it 300 years later. It happened. The king came. So let's look at, at, at a few things that he told the king. Verse 13, which I did not read earlier, said that the people, this is uh, Deuteronomy 17, 13, that the people needed to hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. That's our goal, right? Even though we're failing now, our goal is to hear and fear. That means to reverence God and to want to please him. He said not to set a stranger over you, only one of thy brethren. This is this to me is saying to us as modern day kings and priests in the kingdom of God is only trust your soul or in, in the case of Israel, the soul of the nation into the hands of someone that is part of the covenant. Now, if you're getting a bunch of advice from a bunch of people that are living in sin and have no regard for God, you need to stop that now. Amen. He clearly said that you need to get advice or you need to set over your kingdom uh, as your advisors and your counselors. You need to set people that live for God, that understand God, that walk in covenant with God. Don't put strangers over your primary counselors. That doesn't mean if you're trying to learn architectural that you can't go to an architect and learn how to be an architect. And even though he might not be a Christian, amen, he might be a sinner. Uh, there's trades you need to learn. If you want to learn the painting trade, you're going to hear a lot of cussing. You're going to hear, you know, I mean, I was in construction all my life. I've been in construction since I was 14 years old. And believe me, people will cuss in front of me and they'll say, oh no, you're a preacher. And I'll say, look, I was a construction worker first. Amen. So understand me. I don't, you know, I appreciate you wanting to respect my ministry, amen, and, and thank you for that, and, and uh, it's preferable uh, not to come out with a bunch of colorful language, but if you do, understand that this human being right here, before I was a preacher, I was a construction worker, and I understand the dynamics of all that, but, but yet if I want to put somebody over my soul, over my kingship that God has given me, I want it to be people that are people of God, people that are walking in covenant with God. Now listen to this. We are, we are sending our kids off to college and they are being turned away from God. This is not a fanatical statement from a conservative Christian for which I plead guilty. I am a conservative Christian and I plead guilty to that. But I'm not a wild-eyed fanatic that's telling you don't send your kid to college or this or that. I'm just telling you your responsibilities as a parent does not end when they're in elementary, junior high, and high school. They're going to college, friend, after being raised in a Christian home, and they are losing out with God because of these atheistic instructors that are literally turning our children away from God. Amen. You hear me now. This is a fact. And so we need to understand this when our children and our grandchildren go off to college, we need to be a part of that advice team. Amen. As much as the parents will allow to say, look, you know, you know, you got to watch this. I'll give you a quick story real quick. 
there was a young girl, a beautiful young lady that worked in one of the buildings that I go to, to, to um, do part of my work that I do secularly to make my living, to pay my bills. I tell everybody I'm not a televangelist, so I have to work for a living. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm not a multi-squillionaire. Amen. Kenneth Copeland. Amen. On TV. Uh, you know, I got to work for a living and I've done it all my life. There's pe preachers that have always lived off the gospel and that's wonderful. I, gosh, that would be so great. But me, I kind of ended up in this work and I love to work. I absolutely, when I get through this five minute sermon, I'm going to turn around to my computer screen and I'm going to get to work. Amen. And I love what I do. I love my work. Amen. But, uh, boy, to have all the time in the world to read and your Bible and pray and study and get ready to travel and uh, you know it, it would just be a great thing but i've never um i've never chose that i could have but i would have been on the road many months out of the year and never got to see my family i raised my girls before i started traveling internationally and and i have no regrets over that amen but anyway that young there was a young girl that uh began to ask me questions she found out i was a preacher and she began to ask me questions about the Bible and she got excited. I would answer her questions and I said, look, me and my wife can teach you a Bible study and oh, that'd be great, you know. And before we could get the Bible study going, she started in our local college, McLennan County College. I'll go ahead and name it. And there's a religious professor there or instructor there that basically turned her away from God, okay? He basically taught uh, whatever he taught. I've never been in this class, thank goodness. But whatever he taught, one day I asked her, I said, are you ready for your Bible study now? And she said, I've been going to college. And she said, I, I just absolutely don't even know if I believe in God anymore. Now, that's a sad set of affairs, friend, when you can go to a religious course at a college in America and you can be, turn your back on God and walk away from God. I'm telling you right now, that's a terrible thing to say, but it's a fact. So God tells us to be so careful so careful not to uh, throw ourselves into these situations, amen, to where we are in bad shape. So basically what, we're, what I wanna cover here real quickly is the things that he said not to do. He said, you don't create ways of escape from your religion. Don't, don't breed horses that will carry you back into bondage. So basically to me, that's telling us, do not entertain things from your old life that will cause you to want to go back to your old life. Back in the 70s and 80s, I sang country gospel music. I'm sorry, country music, outlaw music, Willie, Waylon, Jerry Jeff Walker, Ray Wiley Hubbard, all these different ones. We sang at the Hippodrome. We sang at different functions, jamborees, and some beer joints even as a kid, as a young young person, before I even had my driver's license. Hey Amen, we would do this. And, and, and now I've always loved all music and I still love all music and I go to YouTube and I listen to music. And, but I have to limit myself to a lot of music because it makes me start going back in my mind to those days of performing on a stage. Now I still preach on a stage. I sing country gospel on a stage, but it's a different setting. People are wanting to hear the word of God, amen. And I sing everywhere I go. Uh, 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 Bulgaria, Poland, everywhere I go, Czech Republic, everywhere I travel around the country, they, they want me to sing most of the time. Amen. And, and then when I get through singing, they say, hurry up, preach, man. I mean, it's got to be better. No, I'm just kidding. God gave me a talent for that. And I appreciate that. My, uh, my daughter Starla's watching and she has a talent for singing. Amen. But, uh, and Sabrina and, and Savannah, amen. My daughter, Savannah, uh, wrote songs and sang songs under her breath as we traveled. Amen. But anyway, so these things that would want to draw you back, you need to burn those bridges. Not, I'm, I'm not talking about don't ever listen to a song again. I do it. Okay. But when I've had my feel of it, I know, uh Oh, I gotta, I gotta get out of this now. I'm feeling kind of redneck. Hey man, I'm the old Waco rednecks coming back into me. And so, you know, you know what I'm saying? We don't want to saturate ourselves that stuff that's going to create horses that'll take us back to Egypt. I hope that you're enjoying this today. I sure am. Amen. And then, and then he said, don't marry too many wives. Well, we don't have a problem with that. We'll go to jail. You know, you know what I'm saying? Unless you live in Utah, you go go to jail with too many wives. But he's basically saying, don't entertain the lust of the flesh. Do not whatever that is, whatever it is that is appealing to your flesh, basically that translates to me that we are not to stroke and pet the flesh. You know, oh, I love you, body. I'm going to treat you. You know, we all have our struggles, right? 
you know, my diet will prove that to you. Amen. A lifelong struggle to lose weight. It, it, at one time it was cigarettes and God delivered me from that. It, it could be country music. Amen. That takes you back in your mind and makes you want to go hang back out in the beer joints again. Amen. And, and that's, you know, that's not a good scene. I'm just going to be blunt with you folks. I mean, uh, it, it's just not a good scene to constantly feed your mind with things that are that are not productive for you that'll take you back to egypt the horses that'll take you back to egypt amen and then finally he said don't get too rich oh that's not my problem today amen but he told the king and here's what i really want to get at he said have the king to write out this law right take the time take the sacrifice if you're going to be a king in your kingdom, then you write out this law, you set it beside your throne, and you read it every day until your soul is saturated with the good word of God, and your soul is set on fire by God to where you will not want to disobey him. As I close out this five-minute sermon right now, I hope this has blessed you. I hope this has blessed you. You don't cater to the flesh. Amen. You don't create horses or breed horses or do things that will take you back to Egypt, back to bondage, and you simply love the word of God and prayer. I hope it's blessed you folks. I wanna pray for you right now. And as always, I ask you to share me on your wall. I had people write me yesterday, yesterday on my sermon yesterday, tag me, tag me on my wall. So if you want me to tag you, uh, as long as it's manageable, I'll tag everybody that I can. Uh, but anyway, let's pray right now. Father, we love you so much and we thank you for this time with my friends and family. And I ask you to bless them today, prosper them, bless their family, heal their bodies, create the financial uh, network that they need to bring in the finances to live, not only live, but to live well and to be blessed, Father. And we just praise you for today and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Listen, folks. Join us, join me tomorrow at 8 a.m. And then join me Friday with Jim Millsap for our talk, our probably our final talk maybe on depression. And then we'll go into something else. If you have any suggestions for Jim Millsap of what you would like for us to talk about, then please submit that uh, on this wall right now on the chat. Uh, and we love you so much. God bless you. I will see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow. And let me know what this message did for you today. Let me know if it blessed you today. We want to hear these things. God bless you. Bye-bye.